Wonderful. I just want to thank you all for coming out today. Good afternoon. And I also want to thank Mark for inviting me here. So as Mark mentioned to you earlier, I f didn't want to make one distinction. I felt that if you've already made it before and you lost it, the difference that sets me apart from, say, Harvard students is that they haven't had a chance to make it. So they don't have that formula. Does that make sense to you? So, but if you've already made it once, you know the formula to do it again and again and again and again, right? Now, do me a favor. Would you make a commitment to yourself over the next few minutes to play full out? Yes? yes. Are you sure? Yes? Yes. Fantastic. Great. So there's this game called Simon Says. Have you ever heard of it? Yes. Fantastic. If you haven't, it goes like this. It's really simple. And I'm expecting all of you, because you made that commitment to play full out, they're all going to play together, OK? It's really simple. I'm Simon. And you're going to do whatever Simon says. You're not going to do what I do. You're going to do whatever I say. Make sense? If you don't do what I say, then you're out. I trust that you're honest with yourself. And at the same time, if Simon says do A and B, and you do A and B, then because of the and, you're also out. Because I didn't say Simon says do A, Simon says do B. Does that make sense to everybody? So you ready? So Simon says, let's begin. So everyone stand up. So if you're standing up, please sit down. You're out. <laughs> because of the fact that I did not say Simon says. So for the rest of you, Simon says, for the rest of the people who are sitting down, please stand up. Simon says, reach, put your hands up in the air. Simon says, tap your, tap your head. Simon says, put your hands in front of you. Simon says, give yourself a clap. Do it again. You're out. So anybody who clapped is out. All right. <laughs> Simon says, Simon says, turn to your right. Simon says, face forward. Simon says, turn around and keep turning. If you're still turning, when I say keep and keep turning, you're out. OK. Simon says, if you're still standing, come to the side, please, and join me on stage, all right? So. Wow. Oh, so, am I, is this in the way? <laughs> Guys, can you give them all a hand? I wanted to share you a point. You guys can sit down. Thank you so much. <laughs> nice job. Ooh. What? Ooh. No, they're not out. I specifically, usually there's a stage, and I go, Simon says, come up to the front and join me on stage. They usually join me on stage right off the bat. But I said, come to the side and join me on stage. And they actually just came to the side. No, they didn't. They were on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, all right? There's a point. There's a method to the madness. As I mentioned to you earlier, as Mark mentioned to you earlier, he asked the question to me. He said, what would you do if you lost everything and all your contacts? And then what would you do to make it back? And the funny part about that is, I was like, oh, I was like Mark, I was on the phone. I was like, I can do this. Why? Because this is not a theoretical question. Because I did it three times over. Like, I made it, lost it, made it, lost it, made it, lost it, and made it again. Does that make sense to everybody? So I said, I have practical experience <laughs> that I can share with you, right? And, but follow me on this. I really believe that it's about the ABCs or mindset of success. That's what this whole seminar is all about, right? It's setting your mindset. So as a prelude to making all that money, it, I feel, is really important to have a tremendous mindset so that we can move forward and become successful. Does that make sense to everybody? And it's really simple. It's about attitude, belief, and your commitment. Commitment to yourself, commitment to others. All right? Now, let's talk about my history so that you understand how the attitudes and beliefs play into and how it shapes your lives. When I was a kid growing up, I don't know about you, but my father taught me work hard, make a lot of money, save it, and bank it, right? The challenge with that is, as a kid growing up, all of my friends were getting their clothes from Bamberger's, which now became Macy's. Meanwhile, I was getting, doing my shopping at Kmart. My allowance on a monthly basis was a dollar, when the rest of my friends were making 5 to $10 a week. So I felt really slighted. And my attitude is, this sucks, growing up. And I got into an argument with my father when I was a teenager. I said, Dad, I hope to never grow up to be like you. I am going to make so much money that I will be able to spend it and blow it and do anything I want with it and not have to be so cheap as you were. 
And I know some of you, my father said, I'm not being cheap, I'm being frugal. I was like, Dad, you're cheap. <laughs> it's that simple. And sure enough, growing up as a teenager, I started on you know, doing part-time jobs, fast food restaurants, whatever have you. And then when I, became, when I got into college, I decided to take on a full-time job as I was going to college at night. And what happened at that, point, at that point, over the next few years, before I got married, I made a lot of money. I'm talking millions in a short amount of time. And then what had happened was is that with that wonderful blazing attitude of <laughs> I can make as much money as I want and spend it on everything I want, millions of dollars earned. And after three or four years, the most I ever had in savings was $1,500. And I was your typical, stereotypical American where you make a lot of money and you spend more than you make. Matter of fact, back in 1989, I declared bankruptcy in Chapter 7. I erased hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt after making millions. And I was like, wow, because I also lost my job at the same time, coincidentally. So it's kind of hard to support yourself. <laughs> and I also got married at the time with my ex-wife. You know, when you have a family that you're raising and then my son was born at the same time. Wouldn't you agree? So I declared what anybody would ever do, which is declare bankruptcy. So I raised an entire debt of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and on the day I left bankruptcy court with uh, hundreds of people in the audience, what had happened was is I got a job for $100,000. <laughs> so you would think, my attitude changed though. I was like, wow, you know what? I still believe that no matter what happens, even if I lost all my money, I will make the money back. I can always make money, it's not a problem. As long as I have two hands, two feet, I'm good, I'm golden. Does that make sense? However, my attitude changed a little bit because now my son's born. I'm like, oh, you know what? Now I need to support it. So in the next couple years after that, with my son being born, made hundreds of thousands of dollars getting up and running and everything. Didn't change the habit. And what had happened at that point is I got a divorce. So I lost my money again. <laughs> because I ended up saying, you know what? It's not about the money. Because I know to myself, I can make the money. I'll always make the money. So I gave all the money to my wife, gave her half the furniture, and she left with my son. Does that make sense? Because I decided you take care of it, and then she moved down. I live in New Jersey. She moved down to Florida. That was a big mis mistake, and not being able to have my son near me. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. But I was like, that's okay. Now I, one thing came in, though. I had to pay child support. I was like, this is not a good thing. <laughs> but I said, you know what? I know. I'll just change my attitude. Not only do I know I can make more money, all I have to do is I know I just have to make more money. <laughs> I can make more money to support my family as I'm busy doing this. So over the next few, uh, few years after that, I, I made a few more million dollars and over the next five or six years in doing what I was doing. And then what had happened as a computer, former computer programmer consultant, and what had happened after that is just prior to meeting my wife in 1998, I amassed another $100,000 in debt, making all that money, nothing in the bank. However, I was clever enough after declaring bankruptcy to go and buy uh, a, um, excuse me, a Corvette and took out a 25% interest loan. <laughs> because I, w I was all about the glitz and the glamour. It's all about the toys, right? So what had happened at that point is I met my wife. $100,000 later, she meets me. Now, check this out. My wife, when we got married, she's never had an interest charge in her entire life. She's amazing. Never, never owed anybody anything. And she meets me, and I'm 100 in the hole. She's got seven figures in the bank through investments and stuff like that. <laughs> so you would think I married her for her money, but that's so far from the truth. <laughs> but when we got together, she knew my situation, so she bailed me out. She made me write a promissory note before we got married that I owed her the money after she paid off all my debt. Got that? Thank God I got ripped up later. <laughs> but what had happened at that point was, check this out. <laughs> Honey, you're going to be put in charge. That would be me. You're going to be put in charge of our finances. Take care of it. I was like, what? There's something wrong here. <laughs> a person who's never had debt in their entire life, knows how to manage the money, is giving me that chore and that task to take care of this. I was like, I got this. I can make all the money, my attitude, but here's the difference. I made a commitment. You know, sometimes they say, you'll do more for others than you'll do for yourself. I made that commitment to myself that, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of my wife, and I'm not going to let her down. And at the same time, I'm going to establish the fact because I went through entire life just having fun. It is important to have fun. There's no question about it. You need to have fun no matter what you're doing. But I was like, you know what? There's a why behind this. It's not about the dead presence on the back of dollar bills. Does everyone understand that? It's about what can you do with the money. It's a higher purpose than yourself, as my wife mentioned to you earlier in her lecture, right? 
So then what had happened after that is like within seven years, we became debt free. And there was a hundred, over $100,000 in the bank after the first two years. I was jumping up and down. My wife's like, what's going on? I was like, I was doing my happy dance. <laughs> she goes, what's so, what's so, you know, why are you so happy? I said, there's six figures in the bank. So she goes, so? I was like, I've never seen four figures, let alone five, <laughs> let alone six. You know what I mean? That was amazing. But then what happened is when we did it, stock market crashed on my wife because she worked for a company that became MCI that got bought off by WorldCom. We watched the stock go from seven figures to two. So we lost it again. So I was like, now's a change of course. Because I also got downsized because of 9-11 events in 2001 as a computer programmer. So what happened was is we changed course. And I changed course to becoming what we call um, an entrepreneur and starting my own business to create ongoing residual income. And what had happened at that point is that's when the seven years we became debt free. And we have money in the bank and we're really happy. So now what's the point? When I asked you to do the Simon Says exercise, I asked you specifically, what is the commitment to yourself? Just on a show of hands, how many people said when they stood up and played Simon Says that you knew you are going to win? OK, so that's the difference. It's the attitude. It's the belief that you have. It's the belief of success to say, you know what? I'm a winner, and I'm going to win. I'm going to play to win. I'm going to play full out. Because I asked you a question. Would you do me a favor and make a commitment to yourselves to play full out? You follow me on that one? But nobody raised, only a few of you raised your hands and said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win this. I didn't say there was going to be one winner. I just wanted you to play the game and play full out. Does that make sense to everybody? It's making that, it's having that attitude and it's having that belief and that commitment. But more importantly, it's your why. I know some of you turned around when you're looking at the Simon Says, and you know what, I'm just going to play that game because of the fact, I don't want to play that game. You think the C instead of commitment was choice. I get that. But the idea is, if you, make, if you know how big your why is, if you know your purpose, and it's strong, and it's a burning desire, that's where your passion comes out. That's where you can have fun playing. Does that make sense? Because if you're not having fun doing it, why do it? Right? So that's my next point of having fun. To answer your question, what would you do if you lost your money to make it back, it's really simple. It's to have that successful mindset of your ABCs, of having the attitude, the belief, and the commitment, and your why, and determination to know that no matter what happens, you're going to be successful and you're going to make everything happen. You're going to do whatever you need to do to make it work. Follow me on that? It is so, so important. The next question that comes up after that, though, is how what, if you lost all your contacts, what would you do? Well, hopefully it would make sense to everybody that you would have to get your contacts back, right? And the goal as you're getting your contacts back is to identify a need. Find out what people are looking for. And it's really simple from that point. Because all you need to do at afterwards is to, when you identify the need, is to find a product or service that they're looking for and deliver that product to the individual, right? Now, it's all about developing the relationships. So now that, we've got the com now that we've got that mindset of the ABCs, it's about developing relationships so we can get the contacts back. Does everyone understand that? That's so, so important. And there's a couple tools that you can use to go and do so, right? But just in review, remember, we talked about attitude, belief, commitment. We talked about having fun, your why, finding and identifying a need. But some of the tools I want to share with you, would you be interested in some of the tools? Because if you can develop those relationships now for the future and develop that mindset and skill set, you will be golden. And I, if you don't mind, I'm going to borrow Dr. Roger. Sorry, he's one, actually one of my friends who drive up. He's my best friend. And he's going to do the um, exercise with me. Now, in developing rapport, it's about your first impression. Because you only have about less than 10 seconds to create a first good impression in business where the person in that a short amount of time will know whether they're going to do business with you or not. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. And it starts with the handshake. All right? Now, if you can do me a big favor, shake the person on your left and on your right and say hello really quick. And it's just literally, just give them a handshake. Hello. And just shake in someone else's hand. Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm nice Now, we'll go back. We'll come back to that. All right? in a moment so you can identify the different types of handshakes. Now here's the perfect handshake. The perfect handshake, Roger, you can shake your hand? Okay, great. The perfect handshake's like this. We go web to web. Roger, by the way, he has good web. So we go <laughs> web to the web right here, all right? And what you'd want to do is you want to go vertical 90 degrees and you want to shake. Now there is a proper number of pumps. It's three. 
It's three pumps. It's the proper number of threes. This is what you want to do. If you're, you want to look eye to eye, ladies, it's eye to eye. You're not looking anywhere else. It's eye to eye. Okay? And gentlemen, hey, wait. You're not ruled out either. If I'm shaking the hands of a woman, it's eye to eye. All right? And what we're doing is we're smiling and we're shaking and we're introducing yourself. And it's three pumps. I know we got the people who are really excited and things like that. But it's just three steady pumps and saying hello. hello. Now, let me give you some advice in the business world. If someone comes at you with their hands on top, that means they're dominant. They, their word is it. They, they're like, I'm God. So if you have any hopes on doing business in the future, while they're busy shaking your hand like this, just turn it sideways. They won't even know. And likewise, if they come underneath, that's being submissive. This works well for you. <laughs> in multiple ways, okay? Because if they're submissive, odds are, if you're trying to move something, you know, move a product or a service them, they're gonna buy. Yeah. They're submissive, okay? Car salespeople might do that on purpose as a submissive point because they wanna trick you into thinking, oh, I got him, I know, because I learned this. But that's what you wanna do. Now, there's some bad handshakes out there. Have you ever got that dead fish grip? Yeah. It's like, oh, and then you got that clammy one where you're like, you know, just want to dry up. And then you got the, you catch them in the middle of the grip. Sometimes when you catch them in the middle, it hurts when they do that. I usually grab them right here and just jam it into the web just to make it happen. And then, gentlemen, guys, I get this. I understand that you're stronger than I am, and that's okay, you know, being that Superman and having a Superman. But it's not necessary. Do you understand that? It's just a nice, firm grip. By the way, the most you're allowed without permission is up to the elbow. That's about it when you're doing the handshake. Thank you, Roger. So if you could just do me a quick favor, shake the person on your left and right on a bad handshake. Give them like a dead fish or Superman grip, half grip. <laughs> Thank you. Now, ladies, I don't understand what's up with this. I know. Oh, by the way, can you just end on a good note? End on a good note. Just turn to someone left or right and give them a nice, firm handshake. End on a good note. Excellent. Thank you. And oh, by the way, ladies, I don't know what this is all about, this curtsy stuff. <laughs> this curtsy stuff has got to go. By the way, there are some times that you don't shake a person's hand. Does anybody know when you shouldn't shake a person's hand? When they're holding, when they're they're sick. When they're holding what? When you're going in the back, coming out of the bathroom? What else? No, it could be depending on, like, they're Muslim, Orthodox Jew, and things like that. My wife did that one time. We were in business, and we were in Brooklyn, and, we were and she was visiting this guy, gentleman, Abraham. By the way, my wife's Jewish at the same time. And she puts out her hands, hi, Abraham. And he's like, Abraham goes, Lisa. She goes, what? <laughs> okay, so different traditions and different cultures, you don't want to shake their hands. But it's really important that if we develop that good handshake, you can, in that first seven seconds, you know that person might even didn't make that determination if they want to do business with you or not. Does that make sense to everybody? And finally, what I want to bring up with you is basically, whoops, let me just go past because this is just a quick review again. It's matching and mirroring in developing rapport. And I'm looking at some of you sitting in the audience, and it's really simple. In developing rapport, did you ever, when you're talking to someone, say, wow, I really like that person? And I don't understand why. It's because if you can develop the skill set of rapport, of building rapport with the person by matching and mirroring what they're doing, and matching and mirroring can be a numerous things. Number one, matching is if I raise my right hand, you would raise your right hand, right? If I mirror, if I raise my right hand, if, if you're looking in the mirror, you raise your left hand, correct? So that would be mirroring. So if you learn to match and mirror individuals and people, what can happen at that point is they will begin to like you. And matching and mirror can also be the inflection of your voice, the tonality, the speed, whatever the case may be. So if I'm talking to that person who's speaking really slow, do you think they might have a challenge if I come yeah. ra raging at them and yelling in their face, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is to match and mirror their tonality, their voice inflection, and here's the cool part. When you master the matching and the mirroring, what will happen is you can start doing whatever they do. So if you start mirroring everything they do, now you don't want to make it obvious if she's sitting like that, I'm going, <laughs> but you might just make that gradual thing as he's talking, we're talking, you know, just moving, or you know, we just put it here in the laps, and I can see some of the people that you've already matched and mirrored, not even realized it, right? That you'll develop that. And not that we're here at Harvard or anything that you need this, but it's really simple. If for the single people out there, if you're at a bar, just start matching and mirroring across the room. And what will happen is sit the way there, guys, if the lady's sitting there crossing her legs, you cross your legs. Just cross the bar and do whatever they do. And you'll find out in a few minutes, they're like, wow. When you walk by, they're like, I like you. And they don't even know why. Does that make sense? <laughs>
So if you look right here in the matching mirror, check out President Obama on the matching and mirroring on how he's standing and the postures on what they're doing, right? Head back, head back. And of course, we have a little bit right here for the ladies. They, women are really great about this and they do it unconsciously. And finally, if you're looking at how everybody has their hands put in place, it's really, really simple. So if you walk away with learning the mindset that I just shared with you, with your attitude, your belief, and your commitment, and having a big enough why, and learn and use some of the tools that we just shared with you, because how many seconds do you have to create a first good impression? Seven, Seven to ten. Seven to ten, right? With a great handshake. And finally, if you develop the rapport skills of matching a mirror, you'll get to learn and develop those relationships faster than anyone else. Okay, so I want to thank you and I want to thank Mark for having me out here. And I hope you guys the best of luck. Thank you.